I have so many questions about I Want to Dance with Somebody, the enormous uh, biopic that you have coming up where you're portraying mm-hmm. the Whitney Houston. <laughs> and so I'm so interested and fascinated by this process of you becoming Whitney mm-hmm. for the big screen. So as much as you can, take us through what the process was like. Um, yeah. I guess the number one question people want to know is vocally, how yeah. did you train for this role? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the vocal stuff was crazy from the from the get-go I was like okay there was two things that I never thought I would really do on screen one you know was sing in that kind of way or attempt to sing I always knew that Whitney was singing all the way through but you know I was also aware that there was moments where I would have to sing um and I thought maybe I would do a you know sing in something but not right next to (laughs) next to Whitney Whitney you know what I mean so there was that um also I've never played an American person before um and this was my first time and I wanted to be really specific as specific as I possibly could um and I was also really aware that Whitney's voice vocally changes throughout the years she she naturally gets older so you know your voice gets lower but also because of lifestyle and and vocal damage there was like a kind of huskiness about her voice. There was a raspiness that started to grow, which is in such contrast to the kind of um, clear bell-like voice that she had when she was 19. Th- those were all important um, kind of details that I think tells the story through her voice. So it just started with, I ha- I'm not gonna lie, I had three different dialect coaches um, during the, the process of this film, which, was amazing. They helped me at different stages. Um, I started with an amazing dialect coach called Tangela Large, um, who kind of helped me get the basics of of the American accent, of Whitney's accent. Um, And then I moved on to Denise Woods, who helped me in the late stages. And then Bridget Jackson, who who came with me on the shoot and and was there to keep an eye on it. and these are all these are three black women. And what I realized actually was this is you're hard pressed to find um black female dialect coaches, but they're out mm. there and they don't get as much um attention, not as many people know that they're there as, as they should. And that's why I'm saying their names too, because I you know, as much as possible I wanna blow them up and say thank you so much. Um, because I got a bigger understanding of the African American culture by learning them, learning the accent from these women, um, and a huge, yeah, just huge appreciation. Um, yeah, and then there was the movement side to it, <laughs> man. Like there was, but then the movement kind of commented on the vocal stuff, and the vocal stuff commented on the movement, and actually they're all so interconnected. It's a really fascinating journey, and like. Uh, from my like nerdy actor brain it was the stuff that was really like I I could stay there for for months and months and months and I and to be honest I did I I was I was in prep mode for for between the UK and the US for about eight months just Mm. working solidly on that um yeah wow that that (laughs) seems very intense um now I know you talked to um people who, who knew her I know you talked to her longtime friend and one time partner Robin, I know you talked to her brother, I believe it was as yes, well. Uh, yes, right. Yeah. Um, so I guess how were, was there anybody that you, you know, wanted to talk to? I mean, obviously Whitney herself would have been the number one. Yes, person, that would but, have been the <laughs> but aside from Whitney herself, yeah. was there any person that uh, of her surviving friends and families that you, you wish you could have spoken for, spoken with as That's you prepped good. for this role? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I actually didn't get a chance to speak to to Robin. Um, I read her book um, ah, okay. about about Whitney, um, and it was actually really interesting. Um, it was an ex- interesting exercise because I read Robin Crawford's book, which is Whitney from her perspective, as her friend, as her lover, as her support system, um, and then I read Sissy Houston's book too. And that was from the mother perspective. So I was trying to find all of these different um, viewpoints of Whitney so I could pinpoint <laughs> how, if, if I can see how different people saw her, then I knew how to collect all of that information. Um, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, I was pretty privileged when it came to access to people. And, and what took me by surprise the most really was that, I guess it's because it's the entertainment industry and I was filming in Boston, 
there was, and this is a, you know, a big film, a lot of people are involved. I was able to meet so many people who had crossed paths with her just on set. <laughs> like, and it's really lovely, like, when you get to a place where, because you're playing Whitney, people are eager to get that connection back, you know, that they, they came up to me and was just like, I met Whitney at this point, and I, I remember that she did X, Y, and Z, and she said this, and this made me laugh so much, or, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, Janina Lee, who worked in um, makeup, uh, actually worked with Whitney on her last tour. Mm -hmm. um, and she was there every single day. I, she's a beautiful woman. Tisa Howard as well, um, who was head of makeup. These are women who were around Whitney or knew people intimately connected with Whitney. And it, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an amazing thing when you get to sit with these people and, and vibe off of their energy because that's that's what I kind of needed and it was it wasn't even so much of a always talking about it thing it was like a feeling thing <laughs> as well like what I really like doing when I when I talk to people about Whitney is not necessarily like obviously the stories and, and stuff are important but I watch their faces and I like feel their vibe to see how how they like move and smile or frown when they're talking about her because how people feel, like how someone makes you feel, even if they're not around, is a thing that is everlasting and it's the truth of a thing. Um, I was really lucky, man. Clive Davis, Ricky Minor. I, oh, I love that man. <laughs> I love me some Ricky Minor. Bloody hell, he's, <laughs> he's a great guy. He was a great guy um, to know and to talk to and, and so soulful um, and joyful and, and supportive. So I, actually, I, I was... I, I was a I was sport for riches when it came to that. It, it must, um, in, in some ways, be difficult because we, as much as the public thought we knew, there was still a lot of mystery around her. Because I, I remember mm -hmm. the very first time that I saw her, it was the "You uh, Give Good Love" video, and yeah. um, you you know the way they tried to um, position her as like mm -hmm. a pop star that was kind of a goody goody girl and mm -hmm. you know American mm -hmm. princess, and then. Mm -hmm. I I can't I can't quite recall the moment the turn happened. I know her marriage to Bobby Brown was part of it, yeah. but when we all figured out that Whitney Houston was good, we were like, "Oh shit, <laughs> Whitney <laughs> is a home girl." <laughs> that was yeah. a very distinct moment. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I didn't know that Whitney. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> The yeah. New Jersey is in the building. It's coming through. <laughs> it's coming through. <laughs> Uh, so I guess how, as an actor, do you approach that part of it? Is that there's still a lot about this woman that is a mystery? Yeah. You know, I think that was that was the most fascinating part. We ended up, you know, and it comes from Sissy Houston's book where it's like there's this, there's this separation between Whitney Houston and Nippy. And so some scenes belong to Nippy and some scenes belong to Whitney Houston. And actually what I try to do, and I'm, I'm still not fully sure, like I, I've seen the film and, I, you know... I, other people will be able to tell me better than I can because I'm too close to the material. But like the idea of code shifting was really interesting to me. Um, that that she maybe morphed herself from one type of person to another, dependent on who she was with. Um, out of a you know survival mode, out of um, a need to present yourself in a way that is um, appealing um, and palatable for people. Um, and that contrast is really interesting because I think I have it too. I think a lot of black women have it, to be mm -hmm. honest. Because even talking to you now, like, I'm from East London. And, um, like, I know that in the last week I've been, I've been talking with my best possible voice. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I don't know why I do it. But... <laughs> But like literally just before we got on this, I was calling my sister and I was like, babe, like you look wicked, like we, do you know what I mean? And so it's, it's within all of us, the idea. Um, but what, what burden does that give? And I think that's the, the bigger question for me that I was looking at with that it is, what burden is that when the world sees you in one way, but you're actually something else, or maybe you're a mixture of the two and you don't know necessarily how to marry those things together. Um, that 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 part, um, you know, even the whole idea of Whitney Houston was daunting, but it was so freeing for me to be able to take her off of the pedestal and and really look at her as a person like me <laughs> for a second. Like, yeah, we don't have 
uh, I don't have rather the singing skills that she has, but I, I identify with so many of the things that she was dealing with in her life, just as a person. So how did you land the role? What was that process like? Did you, oh, did you audition? Yeah, like yeah, what yeah, was yeah. this? What was it? <laughs> <laughs> I was I was um I was actually working on two projects. So it started in like the summer of twenty twenty. And I was working on a project in the countryside in, in the UK and um they called me up and they're like, Nay, do you wanna audition for um this this Whitney Houston biopic? And I was like, uh yeah, but like what like what part do they want me to audition for? And they were like, Whitney Houston and I was like <laughs> I was like, I was like, don't be silly. I was like, for one, I don't look like I've got a gap in my teeth. We're not the same build. I'm from Britain. Like, this is silly. What? Why? You know, um, they they really convinced me over time just to like, give it a try because I was aware that you know they were, you know, the the powers that be were auditioning everyone. Like, so I was like, okay, you know why not it's you know good to get yourself out there you know even if, if it's not this it'll be something else kind of attitude um and I just started sending in self-tapes and it was locked down at the time so I had a lot of time on my hands and then you know they just they kept on coming back um and being like okay cool like give you a few notes and like let's have a conversation and suddenly like I'm blinking and they're sending me um you know someone to to give me fake teeth <laughs> you know and like and then they're flying over from from the US to do a screen test and still at this point I'm like yeah but they're gonna figure it out <laughs> at some point that <laughs> kind of thing um there was a moment in the screen test however where you know I'm, I'm dressed as close as I can be to Whitney um in the I will always love you video where she's got the black suit on and I'm singing alongside Whitney I will always love you that the drum beat one the doom and I, that part and I swear to God, like, there's only a few moments in my life where I really remember, like, spiritual moments like this. I did it, and I went, oh, man, I think I got it. <laughs> and that was the moment. That was the moment. And I forgot about it afterwards, because I usually do, but I was like, oh, I understand. I, I think I get this part of her, and, I, and maybe I understand why they're, they're asking me to, to... They keep on asking me to audition. Um, yeah, and then I... I got the part while I was working on Master of None. So I was I was still working on Master of None with Lena and Aziz and yeah, I found out I got it and then had to go straight back into work and not tell a soul. <laughs> <laughs>